plants have all the nine essential amino acids. Now that I have your attention, this is probably a claim that you heard many vegans say, but is it actually true? By the way, I'm one of those vegans. Today we will look at the total body of evidence to determine whether this is true or not. On my channel, we don't do if, buts and maybes. We only do absolutes. No, you see, no, you see, I'm talking facts here. I don't do if, buts and maybes. I do absolutes. <laughs> the following study has been brought to my attention by Simon Hill. If you don't follow Simon Hill, I highly suggest that you do so. He's one of the few content creators out there that is actually putting out real scientific evidence. And not only that, but he even has a podcast that has all kinds of scientists or experts on. Now let's have a look at the graph. The graph is divided between essential and non-essential amino acids. Essential means that your body cannot produce enough of it, of that specific nutrient, or that it actually can't produce it at all. The essential ones are of course the nine essential ones, and the non-essential ones are actually 11. By the way, in case you're curious, in some publication you see selenocysteine actually listed as one of the non-essential amino acids as well. But again, it's somewhat debated in the scientific world, so that's why you don't see it in this graph here. As you can clearly see, looking at, for example, the blue lines, that is actually the amount of lysine being present in the food items. It's pretty well distributed, with a higher or slightly higher concentration in animal products. And in case you're wondering, this graph shows 100 calories of each of these specific food items. Now, it goes without saying that animal-based products are more concentrated in those nine essential amino acids. However, it should be also stated that it's not that hard to reach your RDA of those nine essential amino acids when you are consuming a strictly plant-based diet. And I know, I know that someone before even starting watching the video has already written in, but what about the bioavailability? And I'm 100% sure that you will find some of these comments in the comment section of this video as well, because it should be stated that just because you can find the nine essential amino acids in plants, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are as bioavailable as the animal-based proteins. How was the bioavailability actually determined? The protein bioavailability was determined by two scoring systems. One is the PDCIS score and the other one is the DIS scoring system. These scoring systems were primarily studied on rodents and pigs. On top of that, they gave those animals foods in isolation and in their raw form. So we are talking about raw beans, raw potatoes, raw corns here, and the list goes on. Needless to say that the bioavailability ability was of course hindered. And another one of these limitations is as follows. They failed to translate the differences in nitrogen to protein conversion factors between plant and animal based foods. Out of all the macros, protein, fats and carbs, proteins are the only ones that contain nitrogen. You can see that these two coring systems are flawed because you and I are not rodents and we are certainly not pigs. But there's a good amount of research in humans as well and this is also where quite a lot of misinformation comes from in my opinion. Because when we look at human studies you have to look out for a couple of factors. One of these factors is you should have a really good eye on studies that compare whey protein against soy protein. The carnivore tribe and the fitness gurus that are opposed of plant proteins being equal to animal-based proteins will point out to the fact that both groups were consuming an omnivorous diet. It just happens to be that you add a little bit of soy protein on top of it and you make that go against whey protein. And I have to agree with them on this point. Maybe it's because the participants ate all also quite a decent amount of animal-based proteins during those trials and that's where they got their gains from. So I wouldn't really count the studies for this limiting factor. On top of that we have studies that looked at meals in isolation and the muscle protein synthesis. Small reminder muscle protein synthesis means that your body is using amino acids from the foods you're eating to build proteins. Proteins, of course, are not just here to build muscles, for example, but they do a bunch of great stuff within your body. And muscle protein breakdown is when you are breaking down these proteins. By the way, these two processes happen throughout the day all the time. By the end of the day, if your goal is to build muscles, you want muscle protein synthesis to actually exceed muscle protein breakdown. These studies in isolation just looked at muscle protein synthesis after consuming one meal. And what you usually found is that omnivorous meals tend to favor muscle protein 
protein synthesis more than plant exclusive meals. The big limiting factor with these studies, however, is that it's just one meal and you and I, we are not just consuming one meal. We are consuming multiple meals throughout the day. And this is exactly why I always point out to currently only three studies that we have that compare the 100% plant-based diet against an omnivorous diet. Not just looking at one meal, not just adding a little bit of soy protein on top of it or whey protein, but a plant-exclusive diet against an omnivorous diet. And not just for one day, but for weeks. And what do we actually see in those trials? It appears that if you consume on a daily basis around 1.5 to 1.6 grams of protein per one kilogram of body weight, it doesn't matter whether it comes from plants or animal-based proteins. There are literally no differences between the groups in those trials. So what are my takeaways from this? My takeaways are that if you eat around 1.6 grams of protein per one kilogram of body weight, there are simply no differences between plants and animal-based proteins. However, there seems to be a low threshold point in which animal-based proteins seem to be superior. But we actually don't know what that threshold is because these studies have not been conducted as of today. Yes, it's only three studies, but these are the best three studies that we have looking at this topic. And all the other studies are interesting, but I think you can see clearly why they are flawed. If you disagree with my analysis of the total body of evidence, I would love to hear why in the comment section. So what are your thoughts about this topic? Feel free to let me know in the comment section. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.